Hello and welcome to the Operation Griffin Defending Guide to finish off the map. Appropriate timing with this being a wintry map, we've got that event going on now. I believe in the third week of the event you'll be earning double division XP for playing on Griffin. That should help you with maxing these things out, if you have a life, unlike me. Well, you know the drill by now, your KD is not tracked in war, it doesn't matter, so work together as a team to win. And, of course, because we've already covered the attacking half of this map, I'll be omitting many things that were mentioned in that video to avoid repeating myself, like talking about the map layout in detail. Many of those ideas are relevant for both sides, so I'll be assuming you either watched that already or do not care. So we return to the Battle of the Bulge, this time on the Allied side, as we fend off the German offensive campaign. In the first section, of course, we're trying to stop two of the three tanks from being escorted across the line. And as far as class building goes, honestly, now more than ever, pretty much anything will work. Here are some random ideas. Defending classes are never as interesting, because the focus isn't on a unique objective. The focus is more or less on winning gunfights, so there isn't a whole lot I can tell you there. We went over the map last time, so to skip through, snipers are especially effective in that long range C lane, and the A lane is similar, just a bit shorter and thinner. LMGs aren't half bad as well, both of those long range playstyles work well as defenders because you don't need to be running towards the tanks at all times, but the B lane has a lot of shorter lines of sight so you could take something close range and run around in the lanes clearing people off. If your whole team is sniping and nobody's running out there into the field, rebuilding hedgehogs and clearing people off the backs of the tanks, that is a problem. Try to maintain a well-rounded team. Lethals to be throwing at the tanks are fantastic of course. Shockingly, not everyone's going to be using hunker or armored. So there are some class ideas. Let's move on. I'd rather focus on some fun lines of sight, and one main tip. Well, as for those lines of sight, the map is fairly straightforward. The best line of sight I've been using is all the way in the back for the ceiling. There's a spot between this barrel and sheet metal, which may not look like much, but is actually really good. If you stand up, you can see a lot more, but looking through that little gap, you have a perfect view of the second hedgehog in the ceiling. For this spot to be worth anything, that hedgehog needs to be built. But if it is, nobody expects you to be here, you're very hard to see, and they have practically no chance at taking you out unless they're a sniper coming back for revenge, maybe. Even then, you have a great cover advantage. So it's very easy to hold the sea tank there forever, completely solo, by stopping anyone from ever destroying that hedgehog. You don't even need FMJ, that sheet metal is very thin. I've only used this spot five or so times, but in my limited experience, I never recall being killed there. Usually, two or three people come to destroy that hedgehog, and they die, and then they give up, and things get boring. The problem with that spot is, you're very far removed from the other two lanes. It isn't a quick two-second sprint to be looking at the B lane, and pretty soon I end up noticing that A and B are about to be done escorting, so I have to leave that spot to go help out with that, and then at some point while I'm gone they destroy that hedgehog on C. So your team needs to hold down the other two tanks. If they can though, that spot is very powerful, at least until more people learn about it. I tried to look for similar things on B and A, and I found some novelty lines of sight, that's what I'll call them, because they aren't actually very useful, but maybe? I don't know. On B, you can hide behind these wooden boards, and you can see movement in that lane as people try to destroy that hedgehog, and by looking in the top gap you can see anyone who hops into the tank mounted gun. It makes me wonder if this was done on purpose, it can be useful, but it's a pain in the ass to be looking through that thing when the trench is already decent cover. And on A, the pinnacle of comedy lines of sight, if you're always getting sniped when you come here, well, this tiny gap in the boxes is for you. You can see the left side of the hedgehog or the right side of the hedgehog, but not both at the same time. So if you guess correctly, or keep going back and forth, you could deny anyone from destroying this hedgehog and they will never see it coming, but pretty soon I imagine someone will sneak past your watchful eye and that'll be the end of that. Yeah, much more fun to be able to see everything. Well, maybe you can have some fun with those. Now, the one big tip I want to go over applies to defending tank escorting for every map. I'm sure I'll bring it up again for Breakout, even though it seems like obvious information, I think, and yet it's the most common advice I want to be giving to people I see in-game, because it seems like nobody thinks about it, and that is, as a defender, don't push up against the tanks. There is no reason to get near them to try to escort them back. I've even heard somebody on the mic, Prestige 1, not new, telling us as defenders to stop standing around and get on the tanks to push them back. And to that guy, I appreciate that you're into it and playing the objective, that's already better than a lot of people in this mode, but the tanks will roll backwards at the exact same speed, regardless of if you are on them or if they're left completely alone, and I'm sure most of you watching assumed that was the case, but I can show you the test of that I did. I pushed the A tank all the way to around 90%. If you're curious, the time it took for tank A to go from 20% to 70% was 14.4 seconds. I'm using that percentage range so I don't have to worry about the acceleration and all that, and because I'm measuring 50%, you can double that to about 30 seconds to get an idea for the full escort time. When the tank rolled back,
back all alone from 70 to 20, it took 34 seconds, and when a defender pushed it back from 70 to 20, it took 34 seconds. No difference, as expected. I know the icon changes color so it feels like you're doing a good thing for your team pushing the tanks back, but you aren't pushing them back at all, sorry. The only thing you're doing is showing the attacking team with a big red icon that there is a defender on this tank right now, which is giving them a huge advantage in that fight. They will throw their grenades at the tank to clear it off, they can pre-aim and pre-fire you to get you off the tank, and then they'll be pushing it forward again while you have to wait a couple seconds and respawn all the way in the back. That's bad. Don't give them that advantage. Don't tell them that you're there on the tank. Just be somewhere nearby to be ready to kill them off the tank when they get back on it. So that's what I wish I could tell everyone. You're only putting yourself at a disadvantage when you touch the tank like that. Even if they're currently pushing it forward, don't rush into the tank and make it contested, then try to win the gunfight because you've just let them know you've arrived, it's fight time. Try to flank around the outside as much as possible and then take them completely by surprise. Clearing off the tank and letting it retreat is much more valuable than the tiny amount of percentage you might save by making it contested first, especially if you end up losing that fight because of it and the tank continues forward. The only exception to this rule is of course when the tank is about to reach an objective. Then it is absolutely a good idea to dive into it, keep it contested at all costs, maybe stay prone in front of it while your team tries to fight off the attackers. That's when contesting the tank is obviously valuable, when you cannot let it get any further. But in every other scenario, I don't recommend it. Sorry if that wasn't exactly mind-blowing information for you, but based on what I see in game, I think making that one change to your playstyle would help a lot of people. So that's about all for that objective. Let's move on and fall back to defending the fuel. If you happen to have a mine on you, those are always fun to drop down on retreat, catch them when they least expect it. And I usually just retreat to this position on the barrels to deny people using that drop down route. That's pretty fun. Your class doesn't have to change much. You could swap out a grenade for a mine or something like that. Or maybe the good old satchel charge. In the attacking video, I showed the double breach maneuver. Well, how about the reverse double breach maneuver? That's always a fun one. Here's an idea for an LMG class. I rarely highlight one weapon because you can use anything you want and things may get rebalanced over time but I love the Lewis personally it was my favorite gun in the beta next to the SDG feels like the modern warfare RPD with the low recoil three shot kills you don't need an LMG but the name of the game here will be shooting through these buildable log walls something that again isn't secret information but surprisingly not a lot of people do even without FMJ they are very easy to shoot through with anything but a shotgun and it's also very easy to listen for that sound that sound that should awaken something deep inside every war mode player. That sound. Oh, I don't know what came over me there. Well, we got him. Yeah, the charge planting sound is very distinct. Your ears should physically perk up a little bit when you hear that, and you can usually fire through the walls and get that kill, especially on B, where the only way into the site is those two buildable walls. I don't even play with a headset, I'm usually using crappy TV speakers, and you should still be able to easily identify which wall they're planting at and deny it. So that's the core of holding people off. I can show footage of that all day. As far as other things, there is a flamethrower dropped at this stage, of course. I find that very useful in the B barn. Over on A, you can jump up on the left side of this wall to gather some intel, see if anyone's there. And about that back wall on the A site, obviously never build that up all the way or you'll be completely blocking defenders out of the site, making it very easy for attackers to run away with it. It's very common for people to build that wall up halfway as cover, which I'm always torn on. It's a decent idea, but as we've just gone over, it's not like these walls provide the best cover and your upper torso is still visible. And worst of all, obviously, if attackers take control of the site, it makes it easy and fast for them to build it up the rest of the way, and now they have quite the advantage. So, I don't know, maybe better to just go prone and protect it that way. If somebody builds it up halfway, I'm obviously not going to destroy it. It's not a bad idea, but I usually don't build it up myself. For B, I don't have any mind-blowing advice, just remember to switch up your position all the time, go behind the fuel, go into different corners, keep the walls built of course. You could even go outside the barn, and even if you don't have a line of sight on the fuel, you could wait for somebody to start taking it, because speaking of sounds, the sound made when people are grabbing the fuel is very loud as well. So you can listen for that sound cue and jump into action. As a last piece of advice, don't give up too early when somebody is running away with the fuel. Don't think, ah, oh, he made it out of the site, it's too late, we'll never get it back. Well, it is tough to push all the way out there into their spawning area, but the fueling process takes a while on the tank. You can definitely get out there and deny it, send that fuel right back to base. Here, a teammate and I stopped both fuel carriers, they were about to win right here, but we were able to return one of them, and we were already in overtime, so that won us the game.
If they get through that though, time for the final stage of preventing tank escorting once again. So I really don't need to talk about any new classes. You can use whatever you want to use, same type of deal as the first stage. It's good to have some close range people swarming around the tank, and there's also some long lines of sight, especially towards the bridge, where sniping can help out. As I covered in the attacking half, the key to this stage is realizing that the lines on the tank escort bar are not arbitrary progress lines. They represent key points where the map will change. Spawn points will get pushed back, and the tank will not be able to to fall back past that line. It acts as a checkpoint, not that it really needs to, because once they hit that line and the spawns get pushed back, it's very easy for the tank to make progress. And again, as covered on attack, this 41% line is going to be very important for defenders. I always find it to be the easiest place by far to hold them off for a long time because of how the spawns are positioned. Defenders spawn much closer than attackers here, so if you're roughly evenly matched, you should have an advantage as a defender. The key to holding this choke point is maintaining control of both sides, the barn side and the log pile slash roadside. With that crossfire setup, it's crazy tough for them to get the tank through there. So even though the fuel part is over, keep building up those walls in the barn, keep listening for them to plant the charges and denying those people. If you keep that locked down, then you can use that side to defend, which is incredibly useful. Make sure to have picked up that flamethrower, another one gets dropped down the road at this stage, and it's pretty easy for attackers to grab that one if nobody bothers to pick it up. If the tank rolls over it, it just gets destroyed, and I have seen that happen, so pick it up. Using the flamethrower in that position on the side is very effective, just try to burn as much time as possible at this checkpoint, pun intended. I'll also bring your attention to this cheeky spot. You can go prone here and clearly see people running around under this truck. Not a bad spot to use. They can't get you at all unless they also lie down or go around. You kind of have to have somebody watching your back in that barn though, making sure those walls are still built up. Ideally, you want somebody else on board with this strategy. Only one person trying to hold down the barn and fire at the tank from that side is tough, but do your best. I think it's worth it to hold that side. It really helps buy time at that part of the map. I find most of my wins either come from holding them off here or at the very end. Everything in between is generally easier for the attackers. So I guess I'm repeating myself at this point, just trying to stress the importance of that choke point. And remember what I was saying at the beginning about how the only time you should jump onto the tank and make it contested is when they're about to reach the line? Well, consider that 41% line its own objective. Like, when they hit that line, you've lost an objective. Time to retreat to the bridge. So definitely dive in front of it to stop it from reaching that point. Throw those lethals, do everything you can to stop them there. Final tip, you can keep the tank contested by lying down here on the other side of the wall in some spots. Sometimes they don't know where you are and it takes a while to die. Pretty funny. Anyway, if they break through that line, that's fine. Hopefully you wasted a good chunk of time there. It becomes easier for them after that, but obviously keep fighting, waste as much time as you can. There are more checkpoint lines, of course, but they don't favor the defenders as much as that big one. On the bridge, I love flanking around with that wooden scaffolding thing on the right side, and I quite like hiding behind the tank mounted gun here as opposed to actually hopping into it, which you can do. Finally, if they had the time remaining to make it all the way to the end, things will once again get hectic as once again your spawn will be much closer than theirs. After you spam your grenades, make sure to be using the flank route on the right side to kill the people hiding behind the tank. That's the biggest tip I can give. Don't just sit on the mounted guns and snipe from the back. That's how you lose. That little path on the right is very useful for holding them off. Every kill you get is a good thing. You'll be sending that guy all the way back to the beginning of the bridge. And obviously, same thing as before, this is a good time to be diving in front of the tank to keep it contested. That's very helpful to allow your team the time to deal with the people on it. So that's about all for this map. As usual, defending is not as complicated as attacking, especially since I usually cover it second. But hopefully you got something out of this video. Breakout will be the next map covered. I went over some ideas for Breakout back in the beta, but I think I can do a much more complete job with that now. So that'll happen at some point. Pretty busy with the good old finals right now. By the time I'm done with Breakout, there may very well be a DLC war map to cover. Exciting! Well, thanks for watching. I'll catch you next time. <laughs>